Thank you again for the invitation. Okay, so the title might be something unusual, Thin Groups. It's a name that uh, I've given to these things that many of us have been working on. As you'll see, I'll review the background and then the interest in this. I will spend quite a bit of time explaining why I think this is quite fundamental. But let me start out by telling you what the main theorem is, which is a theorem that has been developed over the last five or six years with many people involved, and the final theorem is quite striking and I think extremely powerful, so I hope it will become clear. I think also you might find interesting that it derives naturally from what I was talking about in connection with the Ramanujan conjectures. So it's a way of picking up this key feature that Ramanujan discovered in much more general settings, and I'll explain to you why we want them. Okay, so throughout now, so in, a, in many senses, this is much more elementary than the previous lecture. Previous lecture that was quite demanding in requiring the representation theory of semi-simple groups. Here we're just going to be talking about SLNZ and its subgroups. And the subgroups of SLNZ are as complicated as anything in the world. But I, and I'm not so much interested in the abstract group theory of SLNZ, but rather it's arithmetic. So this, as you all know, is the n by n matrices with determinant 1 and integer entries. And you, we've seen it come up already last time in the general Ramanujan conjecture. So it comes up in automorphic forms, especially subgroups of it. It comes up in number theory, well, uh, in geometry of numbers. <coughs> it comes up in the theory of locally symmetric spaces. And, of course, it comes up just in group theory. So I will stick to Z, but m much of what I say could is interesting and extends naturally to rings of integers of number fields or maybe SR S integers in a number field. So what are the properties of SLNZ that I want to focus on here that uh, we'll be trying to look for in the context of thin groups are the following. Firstly, strong approximation. So this is a version. There are var variants of this, but the simplest version of this is just the following version of the what you might call the Chinese remainder theorem for these matrices. And that is if you take SLNZ, which is this big group of matrices, and you reduce modulo some integer Q greater than or equal to 1, so you, this is a homomorphism into this now finite group, n by n matrices with entries in the ring Z mod QZ, this morphism is onto. This is an elementary fact and an extremely basic fact. And, uh, it's a special case of strong approximation. So keep that in mind. That is elementary. Now there's a much, uh, the fact that that's elementary, but if you look at more general groups and ask the same question, so maybe G <coughs> is a matrix algebraic group, some group given by algebraic equations, like the symplectic group, the orthogonal group, some classical group, or something defined by other equations, you can ask the same question. Is it true that reduction mod Q for every Q is onto the FZ mod QZ points satisfying the same equation. So that's not always true, and the failure of that is well understood. So it's not true for orthogonal groups, but you have to, go, you have, to have simple connectivity. You pass to the spin double cover, and after that it becomes true. And the kind of question involved there is uh, the topic of algebraic groups or arithmetic groups, and it's very well understood. And it's a central problem and well solved it known as the theory of strong approximation. So this is no longer elementary, but it's not as deep as what I'm about to describe here. So that's the background. We have reduction mod Q, and we need to know what's happening when we reduce into the finite group, because finite groups, there's nowhere to run, so to speak. It's, so we land up on everything, unless there's some reason we don't, and then we understand why not. Now, there's a much less elementary property, which I'm going to call super strong approximation or expansion, or in honor of these lectures, I would call it the Ramanujan property, which is no longer elementary. And it has its roots in this theorem of Selberg that I mentioned uh, in the last lecture. So let me tell you what it is. So this is super strong approximation for SLNZ. It's most difficult to prove, in, in a sense, for n equal to 2 here because of uh, something called property T. But if you go to other groups, 
then it's already a hard question and it's intimately connected to the Ramanujan conjectures or weak forms thereof. All right, so I still start with SLNZ. And now I'm going to measure that this, we, we know this is onto in this case, and I want to measure how quickly is this onto. How quickly is the reduction mod Q operate? And I'll clarify what I mean by that. That's what this st super strong approximation is. So to measure this, I will firstly take a finite generating set of SLNZ. So SLNZ is a finitely generated group. Take any generating set. What I define will not depend on the generating set. The constants will, but not the, f the notion. I'll assume it's symmetric, that whenever S is in the generating set, so is S inverse. So in this way, uh, I'll make a certain matrix self-adjoint, so I can diagonalize it as always. Okay, and from the SLNZ together with this generating set, let me reduce mod Q, so I have SLNZ mod QZ, so that's now a finite group, and I have the same universal generating set which I chose, so Q is going to vary, but S I will fix once and for all. And I will make the following combinatorial graph, or Cayley graph, associated with this data, and that's the finite group SLNZ mod QZ, the vertices of the graph are the points in this finite group. And I will join every x in the graph to s times x, say on the left, s times x, where s is one of the generators. So I've now told you how to join elements, how to make which, which vertices are joined. And clearly in this way I get a graph which is s regular. Each point is joined, each vertex is joined to the cardinality of s points. The graph is connected because S generated, uh, S was a generating set for SLNZ, and by strong approximation, by this Chinese remainder theorem, uh, I can get from any point here to any other point. So the graph's connected. And, sorry, what? Sorry, what? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. S is an S, thank you. Sorry, that's a misprint, correct. All right, so that's this... Uh, graph XQ and it's connected as I've just said and the connectedness was equivalent to uh, the connectedness was completely equivalent to the strong approxim approximation so if I measure the qu quantitatively how connected we are that's the notion of super strong approximation and so let me tell you how to do that so I'll say XQ this is now uh, this notion of an expander should be taught in undergraduate <laughs> It is so powerful, you should read the, for example, the long paper of Victorson et al. Victorson was one of your lecturers here, I noticed, uh, a couple, of, maybe last year. Here he has, together with Huri and Leniel, a very beautiful paper of about 80, 90 pages in the bulletin of the AMS from a few years ago, explaining how expanders are used everywhere in computer science, in functional analysis. So it's a very powerful notion. Let me remind you what it is. So the claim the stro super strong approximation property that's true in this setting is that these graphs xq as q goes to infinity form an expander family so firstly the number of v the degree of regularity is fixed once and for all the, the generating set s has s cardinality s points and to measure this expansion i'm going to form uh, the adjacency matrix or the local laplacian i like to think of it so this is all finite dimensional, this is just linear algebra. So I make functions on the vertices, so that's called little l2 of the vertices, and I define an operator which is adjacency operator which is f of uh, Laplacian or adjacency of f at a point is the sum over all the nearest neighbors joined to the point of the value of the function. So that's just the adjacency operator. And the biggest eigenvalue of this operator, the operator, because I chose the set S to be symmetric, this matrix is symmetric in the, in, in the obvious basis. It's a self-adjoint operator. It's got real eigenvalues. The biggest eigenvalue is the cardinality of S, which comes out by just applying, if I take the constant function on the vertices, and I apply this operator, I'll get cardinality of S back because each guy is joined to exactly S guys. And that's easy to see that's the biggest eigenvalue. And it's very easy to see the graphs connected if and only if the biggest eigenvalue is simple. And the measure of how connected you are is how, what's the gap between that to the next to biggest eigenvalue? 
Okay, at some formal level, that's clearly a measure of how connected you are, but it turns out that that captures the entire story in, in about seven different equivalent definitions, which you will find in, for example, Victorson's uh, survey article. So the notion of an expander is that the next to biggest eigenvalue of this adjacency matrix, which is going to be less than or equal to the cardinality of S, and in fact strictly less than the cardinality of S because the graph is connected, I want there to be a universal gap. So there must be a constant epsilon positive, epsilon naught, independent of Q, such that no matter how big you choose Q, this gap is never broken. So it's a spectral gap, and you can imagine a spectral gap is extremely powerful in doing group theory or understanding a random walk on this graph. So for example, if you take a random walk on this graph and at each step move to one of your neighbors with equal probability, the speed of equidistribution will be controlled by simple Markov chain arguments by this spectral gap. <coughs> it should look like Selberg's conjecture. It is the combinator. It captures the, in some crude form the entire features of Selberg's conjecture. And in fact, the proof that uh, of this strong, super strong approximation or this expansion property for the SL2 case is no more, no less, it's easily equivalent to Selberg's theorem that there's a lower bound for lambda 1. So this is a combinatorial way, and hence removing structure, we're just left with the combinatorics, of capturing this feature that Selberg first discovered, and as I explained in the last lecture, was a derivative of Ramanujan's conjecture. Okay, so this is the property that I'm saying is quite a bit deeper because Selberg's theorem is not an elementary theorem, though as you will see in a moment, there are elementary proofs uh, of sorts. And that's this comment here about the analogy with Selberg. Okay, so that... It's, true it's also true. No, but Q... No, no, Q is... Q is Q. Q, Q isn't the prime power. Q is an integer. <laughs> this is true for any Q. <laughs> so I don't need to take Q to the N. Okay, uh, you thinking of Q as being P to the N, right? You thinking of Q as being P. Q is any integer here, it's still true. Okay, so this is a tr tr fact that's true, and as I said, it's not so obvious. If you go to more general groups, so instead of having SLNZ, so I told you that the passage after SLNZ of strong approximation to a more general group is a very important chapter in the theory of arithmetic groups, you can ask the same question, yeah? Is this expansion property true for any semi-simple group G or maybe even more general groups? And the answer is, uh, let's say it's semi-simple, as I say here. In other words, is there a weak form of Ramanujan for any semi-simple group in this combinatorial sense? And the answer is yes, and that uh, was, took quite a while to prove. So Berger and I were able to prove this in all cases except one, which was a tricky case that uh, involved uh, rank one unitary groups for which a technique we had didn't work. And Clausel was able to solve this in about 2002. He, that exact missing case, he was able to stabilize a trace formula using work of Kotwitz and use the, uh, the, the general strategy that I told you Arthur's methods would give to bring you to GLN to finally give a non-trivial bound. So his proof is, in fact, quite complicated. Sorry. Our proof is a sort of low road proof which uh, buys this bound. Quite sharp bounds, all of these but by an entirely different method. In any event, this is, now, this is now known. As you'll see now, this will be subsumed by a much stronger theorem, which is much more general, though when it's proved in this method, using automorphic forms, it always is proved with a very explicit and powerful constant. So we do know this property of super strong approximation for SLNZ, as well as for semi-simple groups, and it's a fundamental property uh, capturing this Ramanujan type property. All right, now I'm going to do something that uh, might look a bit strange. In a way, it was born, Lubotsky got me into this, as I'll explain in a minute, but uh, there was work of Weisfeiler which really starts this, and I think Norrie used to be here, he extended this work. There's a remarkable feature here, and I want to convince you, I was, a very skept I was quite skeptical of this 15 years ago, but now I'm completely bought, bought into this, that this is very interesting and powerful. And instead of taking just SLNZ or a congruent subgroup or G and GZ and a congruent subgroup, which is what we normally work with in the theory of modular forms, let's take any subgroup. 
Okay, let's take a subgroup, which is a subgroup of SLNZ, but I'm going to assume the group's not too tiny. I'm going to assume it's the risky dense in SLN, or it's the risky dense anyway, and it's the risky closure. <laughs> so <laughs> that means I'm really looking at any group. Although you'll see in the end, I will always want to know whatever property we're looking for, you have every right to ask that the only thing you want to know about gamma is it's a risky closure. That's something you can almost always compute. The risky closure is a very weak thing. It's the smallest algebraic group to contain gamma. So it's given by polynomial equations. And if you can't compute the risky closure for your group, well, then you should have no right to try to do anything of the type I'm discussing here because I'm asking hard questions. All right, so we're going to ask the same question. Suppose gamma's finite index in G is, e is strong approximation and this new notion, or this notion that's been around for a while, super strong approximation, still hold. If gamma's finite index in SLNZ or in GZ, if we're in a more general situation, then both those properties easily are, are easily resolved. So the real interest is when gamma, the new interest is when gamma's infinite index, <coughs> say in SLNZ, but the risky dense in SLN, is it still true that you have strong approximation? And is it still true that you have super strong approximation? So those are the basic questions. So I'll say gamma is thin. That's the title of this lecture. If it's infinite index in its natural Z points. In that case, we're not in the theory of modular forms. If you were to think of things in terms of modular forms, if you were to take GR and divide by gamma, you would get an infinite volume quotient because your infinite index, and it's sort of a rule of modular forms. The whole interest, if anybody says to you, why are modular forms interesting, or why are they special, is because you say there are very few functions, eigenfunctions or holomorphic functions or whatever they are, which live on a finite volume or compact quotient, so they have to be very basic objects. Once you go to infinite volume, then you're talking some kind of, if you want to do the analysis of this, one of fellow who I worked with for many years, older fellow, he's no longer alive, Ralph Phillips, he loved to do scattering theory on, on this infinite volume thing because you had a big infinite boundary. But that's analysis, right? I want to do number theory. So when I used to work with him, I'd say, but yeah, let's, let's forget this infinite volume. I'm a converted man. <laughs> it's interesting, and there are many number theoretic problems that actually demand it, as you'll see. All right, so the remarkable thing that I, I'm here to tell you about two theorems. One is that strong and... Strong, I don't need to tell many of you since Nori was here and he certainly was one of the workers in this field. But super strong as well, strong and super strong hold for thin groups. I'll have to clarify the exact theorem. They continue to hold even though you are infinite index. So the part of strong approximation is the following. I'll give an exp explicit example of it. It was first discovered by Weisfeiler, Matthews and Wasserstein. A much better proof was given by Nori, which gives explicit values for this, which is used in practice. And this theorem is used now all over the show, and when I try to sell thin groups to you at the second half of this lecture, I will give you some examples. I just first want to state the main theorem. Okay, so here's the, th the Weisfeiler theorem uh, in its original form. So suppose I have a subgroup of SLNZ, you can put Z there. Suppose it's finitely generated, and there's a risky closure of, of, the sub of this group so the smallest algebraic group over the complex numbers is SLN to container. So it's algebraically not too small. But of course, in practice, it can be very small in the sense of being massive infinite index in any sense of the word in SLNZ. Okay, then when you look at strong approximation, so if you reduce modulo Q, think of reducing modulo a big prime, the image is a finite group. And you find, when you start looking at what you're doing in a finite group, you should probably, that's what this theorem says, you, you can't remember that you were thin. That is, once you go to a finite group, you lose any memory of having been thin. In other words, strong approximation still continues to hold. So the exact theorem is there is a number Q naught, such that if you relatively, so this you, is a function of gamma. In the original proof by Weisfeller, they used the classification of finite groups, so there was no real specification of this number. This was the advantage of Norrie's proof, by the way. So you can compute this in many examples, this number Q naught. But anyway, there's a number Q naught, which depends only on this thin group gamma, such that if Q is relatively prime to Q naught, then it's still true that the reduction is onto. 
So there are finitely many bad primes. And if you keep away from those finite, and you often want to identify those bad primes, you keep away from them, you are onto. So you at least know what you're doing if you're ever going to count congruences. If you're ever going to do congruences moving around on gamma, this theorem says, well, there's a finite number of bad primes. You better find them and do something with those. But otherwise, the group doesn't know that it's thin. All right. Now, in the 90s, my co-author, Lubotsky, who I've worked with for years and who's a group theorist, started asking these questions. And I thought he was... I couldn't quite understand why he would ask this question. Is it true that... So he knew, of course, of this theorem. In fact, I think he inspired somewhat uh, Weisfeiler to work on this. <coughs> he asked whether this expansion property remains to be true, this strong approxima super strong approximation, if you thin. It makes sense to ask it once you know this theorem. Once you know Weisfeiler's theorem, once you reduce mod Q, because remember, super strong approximation was just a question about what happens when you reduce mod Q. You reduce mod Q, you've forgotten whether you were thin or not. Now you, can, you still have your generating set S. You can ask whether these graphs form an expansion. And he was asking it more as a challenge, which is why I thought, well, okay, why are you interested in that? Why are you interested in such a deficient group being an expander? All right, you'll have to wait for the whole lecture. Uh, so the main big theorem that is now known is that we have a complete answer to this question. We know exactly when that's true, when super strong approximation is true, and it's thanks to many people, many people. All right, so the first, so I'll go through and explain what each of these people did, then I'll explain what you, to you what the main theorem is. So the first thing was to give a proof of a Selberg-like theorem which had nothing, which used minimally algebraic geometry, automorphic forms, so that you could free yourself of those techniques. And that was given by Xu and myself in 1994 by a method which is at the heart of every proof uh, afterwards. It used only finite group representations, properties of representations of finite groups in particular, the property that if you have uh, sh uh, something like SL2 of FP, and you look at its irreducible representations of the complex numbers, so this is a representation of a finite group, if you're not the trivial representation, then the dimension of the smallest irreducible representation jumps dramatically to a small power of the order of the group. So if you're not trivial, you're already very big. That was a key ingredient, coupled with some crude upper bound counting arguments in order to prove a spectral gap. So we gave a very simple proof of a Selberg-like theorem, not 316, something a little weaker, which worked for non-arithmetic groups, but at that point I wasn't thinking of infinite index subgroups, <coughs> but the proof <coughs> had a lot of power to it. <coughs> it was used by Gumbin, a former student of mine, uh, in his thesis in 1999 to handle this question of Lubotsky for many infinite index subgroups of SL2Z, but not the most general infinite index subgroup. It had to, it was infinite, vo in, the volume of the quotient could be infinite which could be measured then by the Hausdorff dimension of the boundary, and the Hausdorff dimension of the boundary had to be not too small, and then the proof could still work. But he was the first to handle infinite index. But when the index was small, uh, when the sort of the Hausdorff dimension in that, s in that simple case was small, we ran it, there was, there, there was a major barrier. In other words, the group representation part of what Xu and I did was still easily there, but the uh, counting argument, which was done by, put, by counting the number of solutions to integer equations, upper bounds, crude upper bounds, was lost if the dimension, if sort of the group were too small, and the counting has to be done sort of internally. So combinatorics had to be brought in, and this was brought in in these two papers first by a lovely paper of Harold Helfgott in 2006. So this started to move dr dramatically again in 2006, uh, where he used something that I'll end the lecture a little bit and explain to you something about some product. This is a purely combinatorial statement in a finite field and in SL2FP, which is pure combinatorics about what happens if you multiply sets inside a group. There yeah? Is there a new proof of uh, this, will, this, this theorem, I'll, I'll, I'll comment on it in a second. Now, it does not given uh, property tau, yes, not property t. Yeah, property, absolutely, much more for these groups, yeah, much more.
So tau, yeah, that's something Lubotsky likes. Tau, I don't like it so much. You see, I didn't use the terminology. <laughs> it's the expansion property, right? Uh, Bagan and Gumbert uh, then developed. So Helfgott didn't get this expander property, but in order to carry out this argument of Schuert myself, there are two parts. One is the upper bound. And to get the full upper bound, Bergen and Gumbert invented a very brilliant technique called flattening. I'm not going to go into any of these. All this was done in SL2, this and that. And then to get the full uh, expansion theorem for an arbitrary Zariski dense subgroup, which is done in this paper by Bergen, Gumbert, and myself, and to do it for all Q, at least square free Q, which is absolutely critical for what we were developing this for. I haven't explained that yet. Uh, you had. Uh, you had to deal with the fact that Q may be a product of many small primes, and then there are many subgroups, and it be, there, there was a secondary, much more difficult combinatorial problem, which is handled in our paper here. Yeah. And that's as for this, at this point, we had everything for SL2 or forms of SL2. This theorem was known for SL2. And generalizing it required to understand the argument of health god in general, and also to generalize our complicated argument. And both of these looked quite non-trivial. And these were solved within three hours of each other. <laughs> Let me explain that. The first, the generalization of health god was done by Pieber and Sabo in 2010 and Brouillard, Green and Tao in 2010, within three hours of each other. Now, if anybody, you know Terry Tao, he came and gave a lecture. This man uh, knows to how to type, I think, at least, and he, and he types sensible stuff. <laughs> yeah, but I think he's got a manuscript ready, half-baked manuscript on anything. So this was announced by Piba and Sabo, and within three hours, these guys posted their solution of the problem. And the solutions were the same, by the way. <laughs> so the thing was in the air, and there was a breakthrough of Rushovsky, actually, uh, on this. Helfgott was claiming that he could do this, but he was uh, quite seriously stuck, it would appear. Anyway, these were solved at the same time. I've got a joke here about Terry Tao. I'm going to announce a proof of the Riemann hypothesis, and then he'll follow it up with his proof of the Riemann hypothesis, and then I'll say, yes, that's what I had in mind. <laughs> so we, maybe it's a good way <laughs> to get it out of somebody. <laughs> anyway, he's amazing. He seems to uh, be able to solve many, many problems and uh, quite striking. Uh, but this was announced three hours of each other. The generalization of Bergen, uh, Gumbert, and my, uh, myself's argument, this is the general Q to a general Chevrolet group, was, uh, well, first for SLN, was done by Varju. This turned out to actually be even more difficult, and his proof is really ingenious and is a much better proof of our case, even. So Varju, who's uh, finished his degree at Princeton uh, last year, really uh, made these things feasible, this aspect of it. And then the most uh, Salehi, Ali Reza Saleh, <coughs> together with Baju, developed the final and most powerful film. So now let me tell you the big film, <coughs> which is the following. So you have a subgroup of SLN, you, uh, you have a finite generating set, and you form these graphs, which are the reduction mod Q relative to the generating set S. And you ask, is this an expander family? That was the question we were asking. This is a super strong approximation. The only weakness in this, so this is almost final version, is so it's just a matter of time now, that we only have it for Q square free. So there, if Q's not square free, there's some technical things which still need to be handled and in fact must be handled for some applications. In any event, let's pretend that's not there or we'll just stick to that case. Then again, there's a number Q naught that comes from Weisfeiler, such that if you uh, relatively prime to that, then you are an expander if and only if, so it's not true for any group, if and only if there's a risky closure of gamma, the connect, so you, have this, you take, so everything is to do, this you always should be able to compute. You compute there's a risky closure of gamma. If that's a perfect, the connected component of the identity, if that's a perfect group, meaning it's commutator as itself, this is an algebraic group defined over the complex numbers. This you can, is usually the case. Of course, it needn't be, but anyway, if that's perfect, then you are an expander, and if you're not, if this is not perfect, if they're characters, then it's actually false. Then you're not an expanding family. So they've determined exactly the condition. So you start with any subgroup of SLNZ or GLNZ, you take the Zariski closure, and 
once you know there's a risky closure, you know whether a super strong approximation holds. So this is the complete and ultimate theorem. And I, I must emphasize that the proof of this is highly non-trivial. Uh, and it's, it really should be written up now in a book, which would be quite long to contain all the details. Because the combinatorics in some parts of this is, is extremely involved. No. No. No, you don't need simply connected for this aspect. But still the strong approximation. The strong approximation is a separate question. Right. So the strong approximation you need simply connected to uh, be onto. Yeah. But this part you will look at each component and get this expansion property. <coughs> so this certainly contains uh, the property tower theorems. And this is property tower. It tells you not a property tower was only set up for semi-simple groups anyway. So this is telling you exactly when it's true. This is the ultimate theorem, and it's uh, uh, quite striking. All right. Now I want to explain why uh, I got interested in it, and then to explain to you that there are hundreds of other reasons. I'm going to spend a lot of time in a moment explaining to you what where thin groups come up everywhere. And they've been there all the time, but we've never had tools to tackle any problems, which is why I think they, I would have ignored them. So the first example, uh, there's something called the affine sieve, which is why uh, Bergan and I and Gumba developed this from 2005 and 2006, is a sieve where you try to count, uh, you have an orbit, you have gamma. It's a subgroup of SLNZ. You look at it acting on an integer vector in Zn. So you take a vector in Zn. You take the orbit of the group, and then you get a bunch of vectors in Zn. Maybe you ask, uh, can I find infinitely many points in this orbit in which the first coordinate is prime, or where the first coordinate is almost prime, or where the product of the coordinates is prime, uh, is got least number of prime factors, or some polynomial of the coordinates has some property. So if you, do the, if you ask these questions and your group is just z goes into z plus 1, translation on the line, or translation in zn, then you're asking the standard problems like, are there infinitely many primes of the form x squared plus 1? If you take your polynomial to be x squared plus 1, the orbit is just z. Or if you take uh, z cross z and you look at a line, you would be asking the twin prime conjecture. And so, in the, main, the most powerful tool, especially for almost primes, in the context of zn or z, is called the Brun combinatorial sieve. And for reasons, many reasons, we were trying to first develop a Brun combinatorial sieve in the context of an orbit of a group. And the Apollonian packing was a good example of where we were trying to answer certain questions, as I'll show you in a second. Uh, and as we started looking at this, it became very clear that there's a very big difference between the orbit of a group, like a semi-simple group like this, and the ability to execute an elementary Brun sieve as opposed to Z or any amenable group. So there's a step in, what was a Brun sieve? Anybody who doesn't know it, just listen to what I'm saying. And if you do know it, you'll appreciate what I'm saying. <laughs> if you have a Brun sieve, what the Brun sieve is, if you want to uh, give an upper bound for the number of primes in a certain, up to X or something, you do this inclusion, exclusion, very brilliant inclusion and delicate inclusion exclusion process which might be say you want to count the primes up to x you remove all the guys which are divisible by two you remove all the guys which are divisible by th three you put back all the guys divisible by six and you ca carry this out if you carry this all the way up to square root x you will be left with the primes and you'll be happy trouble is you can't analyze things that far so what the Brunsev does is says you can truncate this process much earlier than square root x and still get approximations to the truth by a combinatorial inequality. That's the great, and the Brun sieve is really stunning. But what this does is you strike out all the numbers divisible by two, that means you're looking at all the guys in a progression. So this is a congruence condition. And you better be able to count the number of integers up to x, which are divisible by two. If x is large and two is two, then there are about x over two integers which are divisible by two. You don't think that that's a hard problem, but yes, the number of numbers which are less than x div divisible by q is a very easy thing to estimate. That's because the line has got the shape and the boundary is very small. Imagine I'm on a tree, which all these semi-simple groups, these orbits are behaving as if they're hyperbolic, and they are. 
Then I want to count how many points are there in, in, on a tree. So maybe I have a tree-like structure defined on this orbit. Maybe I use the group S with its generators to define. Maybe S is free and I'm moving out and counting. And I want to see in a big ball how many guys are divisible by Q. And Q must be allowed to still grow if you want to do a Brun serve. Not too much, but you'd still have to have it grow. At least like a power of the, of the underlying parameter. Okay, then we're trying to count the number of points in a big ball in which we have some congruence conditions. Well, you can imagine even the number of points in a big ball is a tricky issue because the number of points in the boundary of the ball is the same as the number of points in the inside of the ball. That's a property of hyperbolic geometry. The length of the boundary is the same size as the volume of a, of a disk, which is very much different in the line where the boundary size 1 and the length is R. So Brun never had to face a, a Ramanujan or expansion property. It's exactly the expansion property that allows you to make this count sufficiently accurately that the number of points which satisfy some congruence conditions in a big ball is what you expect. The fact that the smallest eigenvalues, the constant function, is what you expect and that you get what you expect comes from Weisfeiler, strong approximation, telling you the algebra is all worked out. And then to say that it's accurate, you need a spectral gap. So to serve, you more or less equivalently need a spectral gap. I have not proved it's if and only if. But it's morally the same. So the term is given by always, by, always given by a uh, strong approximation. Yeah. So, of course, if you're going to count the number of primes, you have to do, as I said, you include exclude. So the main term is always what you predict, and Weisfeiler will tell you you're predicting the right thing. So if you want to do a combinatorial serve, we quickly realized we need this super strong approximation, and that's why we put all this effort into it. So it's very good to have that. And now we have the, the principle of the Brun service ex can be done in complete generality. We call that the fundamental theorem of the affine serve. I won't go into that. Let me just show you why it comes up, if you like it or not, in various problems. So the one that drove me the most was this Apollonian packing. I mentioned it in the first lecture. I didn't, I, I didn't go into the details of what was a thin group there, but let me tell you what the thin group is. It's born as soon as you look at that Apollonian packing. So here's your uh, thin group. Let me take the quadratic form to the sum of the squares minus the sum of all of them squared. This is a quadratic form in four variables. It's an integral quadratic form in four variables. If you look at over the reals, it's got signature 3, 1. It's a Lorentz group. Okay? That's a nice quadratic form. It's called the Descartes form because if you have four circles which are mutually tangent in the plane, like you saw in those pictures, I'll, give you, I'll remind you the picture again, if you look at their curvatures, their curvatures, uh, all the points lie on this cone f of, on f equal to zero. So the orthogonal group of this quadratic form is critical for us. So G is going to be the orthogonal group, and GZ would be the Z points of that orthogonal group. Now let me look at the following group generated by these four elements in GZ. These are the four elements which you get by putting a new circle from the old circle when you invert in making an Apollonian packing. And they are integral matrices. They are actually involutions. They are actually reflections. If you look at them, they are linear reflections. So S1, S2, and the same with S3 and S4. S1, so you can see here it's minus one ones and it's got twos there. And here it's got still the, one, the minus one went to there. And the, uh, this is a misprint. There should be twos somewhere here. It, there should be a two there and a two there, sorry. <laughs> and similarly with the third and the fourth. So you have S1, S2, S3, S4, and you take the group generated by S1, S2, S3, S4. It's a finitely generated group. It's called the Apollonian group because it's the symmetry group of the Apollonian packing. You could view it as the Galois group even of the Apollonian packing. And its orbit, the orbit of this group on a four vector, gives you exactly all mutually tangent four vectors inside an Apollonian packing. So I remind you, this is Apollonian packing. You start off with these four vectors. You take this Apollonian group and you apply it to minus 11, 21, 24, and 28. I'll get an orbit of four integer vectors. Those are all the mutually four tangent vectors in Apollonian packing. And you can see now why that integrality is preserved if what I'm saying is true. And the most important thing about A and what makes the problem uh, Apollonian packing problem so interesting and difficult is that A is thin. A is a subgroup of the orthogonal group of Z points. Uh, 
but it's infinite index. And that's not difficult to prove in this example. So if you want to understand anything about the integers in this, or the infinitely many primes, if you want to serve here to produce infinitely many primes, then uh, you are asking a question about serving on a group which is thin. It's born thin, you can't change it. You can change the problem, but if you want to ask about this picture, it's completely dictated by this thin subgroup of this orthogonal group. So we can, so let me give you some examples of a theory. I mentioned one before. I was able to prove the infinitely many primes in there. So any Apollonian packing's got infinitely many primes. It's got infinitely many twin primes. <laughs> it's got infinitely many circles which are mutually tangent, both of which are prime curvature. The local to global conjecture is the most interesting unsolved problem. And as I explained that in the first lecture, it is unsolved. But it's harder than Hilbert's 11th problem, precisely because you're asking a Diophantine equation on a thin group rather than on all the integer points. And I... That's just the statement that there are infinitely many circles here whose curvatures are prime. So, I think, is, is 61 a prime? Yeah, is one of... <laughs> and there are infinitely many pairs of circles, if you go deep enough here, Twins means they touch each other and they both curvatures are prime. So, uh, no, so uh, to pr uh, the Brun serve never produces primes. So, we know that theorem is proved by ad hoc methods, eventually using, I eventually reduce it to a half dimensional serve, regular half dimensional serve and special tricks. Everything else uses this, uh, all the other theorems use heavily the spectral expansion. This one, because I produce primes, you probably guessed, does not use it because the only thing we have working in this generality is the Bruin serve. So we can produce almost primes and things like that, but not primes. The Bruin serve has never produced primes, even infinitely many primes. Because <laughs> the minute it does, it'll probably, what? Parity problems. Yeah, they're parity problems that prevent it. So we're not, the, the, the interest here is the generality of the argument, not, we're not trying to, Okay, I can say I solved my own twin prime problems. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I mentioned that theorem last time. So I now I want to give you quickly a few more examples of why, why thin groups come up n very naturally in, in group theoretic problems, in uh, geometric problems, in hyperbolic three manifolds. And then I want to dis discuss what I've become quite fascinated by with, with the question of when is a group thin? If you use this theory, when do you actually use it? Exactly. But I should emphasize that in that major theorem there, and any version of the theorem, including the application to the Apollonian packing, which we had done, you know, that's not the general case. So that was done by Gumbert, Bergen, and myself. The fact that the Apollonian group has a spectral gap. The Selberg property for the Apollonian group we did some years ago. I don't know a number. It says there's an epsilon naught positive. The proof is so involved. It's not... In, it's not uh, ineffective in principle. But if you were to work out a number there, I think maybe Kowalski, somebody told me that he went through the proof and has now put a number, you know, 10 to the minus 700 or something. So you can put a number, it's just, it's almost inhuman. So, and all results depend on, the, qu the quality of any result depends on that. So if your group's not thin and you can use automorphic forms, you'll get uh, almost primes with far few factors than so it's very important, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's nothing like a Ramanujan graph, it's very weak. But it has a gap. All right, here's a purely algebraic statement that apparently was uh, unsolved for some time. So if you take a finitely generated subgroup of GLN Z, C. So now we're just talking about group theory. It's a linear group, that's all is assumed here. Finitely generated subgroup of matrices with arbitrary entries. And suppose you look at the powers of the matrices, which are at least two. So you look at the union from m equals two to infinity of gamma to the n. So these are the union of all elements which are powers. And you ask, could that cover all of the group except well, finitely many translates of this cover the whole group? Well, if you are abelian or something like this, then it's, the answer is yes. But the assumption is, suppose that the group uh, is not virtually solvable. then it was 
an unsolved problem whether this could possibly cover the whole group. And the theorem is uh, using this expansion, you can specialize parameters. So in GLNC, you can specialize parameters. You can make your elements uh, algebraic S-arithmetic integers in some number field that's finitely generated. And then you can just use your groups thin inside the z-points there. And then you can control random walks with exponential rate. You can say that, prove that this, in this setting, the number of uh, the set P, if you run a random walk on S, the probability of hitting P is exponentially small. And hence the set is tiny. And hence it cannot cover the whole thing up to a finite number of translates. So this set, this problem has nothing to do with expansion, but it was solved very recently precisely by using the thin group theory. So that was an example in just group theory. I want to explain an example where you use finiteness to get uniformity of points on varieties of a number fields. So if you have a Riemann surface, uh, a comp uh, just a Riemann surface, this over the complex numbers, it has a genus. The genus is something you should be able to compute. And the genus is the most important invariant of a curve. There's another invariant called the gonality, which is the minimum degree in which you can realize this curve as a cover of P1. So the gonality is a number which is at most the genus over 2 plus 1. That's just the riemann rock theorem. You can always find a meromorphic function of certain degree by riemann rock So the minimum degree... F uh, sorry. The minimum degree for, with which you can uh, realize this complex curve is called the gonality of the curve. And the question of the gonality of curves enters in a way that I'm going to describe here, but let me remind you of a very beautiful inequality of Yang and Yao, which uses uh, the fact that if your, uh, one curve covers another with a small degree, then uh, you can estimate the smallest eigenvalue. So the claim is that if you take your curve X, and it's covering P1 with a gonality which is D. And you put the hyper, let's suppose the genus is greater than or equal to 2. So you put the hyperbolic metric on your curve. So your curve is a Riemann, it's a, <laughs> a, a complex curve, but you put the unique hyperbolic metric on there. Now I can talk about the smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian, which is some number lambda 1. Then the gonality is at least, at least lambda 1 times G minus 1 over 4 pi. It's an inequality of y Yang and Yang. So if you know a lower bound, suppose you have a sequence of curves and you have a lower bound for the, for the Laplace eigenvalue, precisely the question of expansion, then you'll have a lower bound on the gonality. That's not an obvious thing to see. The Selberg's bound for this expansion is a very powerful thing. So this will control the gonality of the curve. So for example, in Selberg's theorem, Xn, as I explained in this lecture last time, as a genus, which is about, uh, the volume is about n cubed, but the gonality, according to this thing, yes, since he proved lambda 1 doesn't go to 0, is also going to be the same as the genus. And on the other hand here, uh, the uh, minimum degree, the gonality is at most another constant times the genus. So the gonality is growing linearly with the genus. You control completely the gonality, this very subtle invariant, precisely because you control expansion. This is very useful. Uh, there's an application by Fry, which is kind of cute. Suppose you look at Xn, the modular curve Xn over Q. This is a curve defined over Q. It's got only finitely many rational points. But Fry observed after seeing Folting's uh, much deeper proof of the Model conjecture, the theorem about sub-varieties of abelian varieties, that you, if you fix a number d, then and if I use this gonality result, if n is bigger than 230 times d, so if you look at the curves, they're sufficiently complicated that their gonality is going to be bigger than, from this theorem, big enough. If n is bigger than 230 times d, then the set of points on x naught n whose coordinates lie in any number field whose degree is at most d. So it's a union of all these fields. So that each... In each number field fold things, old theorem will tell you they're only finite, actually Mazur's old theorem will tell you they're only finitely many points. But if you, this is completely uniform over all the fields. So this is a quite striking statement that X naught N has at most finitely many points from all those fields. Can you get that from the lower uh, You can't, coupled with faulting's theorem on some varieties of abelian varieties. That's Fry's observation. It's a lovely observation. 
So the recent work of Ellenberg, Hall, and Kowalski, which uses thin groups, I'm telling you where thin groups, is they have a family of curves. They tried to study a Diophantine problem, which quickly gives them a family of curves, just, but not XN. It's a family of Riemann surfaces, but they defined over Q. And the deck group is related to some thin group in a, some symplectic group. And the combinatorial expansion that now is known from that general theorem gives them that the gonality of their curves grows so that they can then apply foldings to get a uniform Diophantine finiteness theorem for the problem that I will not write down. But the key ingredient other than foldings is the fact that you have a lower bound than lambda 1 coupled with a setup that they have, which is very nice. So there's a good old-fashioned finiteness theorem, uniform finiteness theorum, for which the... We have very, uh, they need to control the gonality, not just that it goes to infinity, but that it goes fast. Not linearly. But the moral of the story is if you're going to make this expansion work, it will give you linear, you'll either get nothing or, lin or lin uh, the, the right lower bound. They come together. That's what the theorem says. So, say, say it again. For, for my curve, the gonality does, uh, so that's a Z mod N Z. So, wh yeah, what is the gonality? Here? P? Yeah. So it's not, uh, but the for my curve, of course, is not uh, like X naught N. It's, uh, it's a Z mod PZ cross Z mod PZ cover. Yeah. So wh what's the question? Oh, oh, yeah, those curves have gone. Yeah, yeah, you do know some families grow with gonality, right. The thing that doesn't grow is hyperelliptic curves. <laughs> right, but if I give you a curve and I say, what's a gonality? It's very hard to estimate it directly. Especially if, um, to, to show X naught Xn has gonality growing like the genus is as hard as Selberg, I think. It's, it's about the same order of difficulty. I'm going too slowly here. Uh, there, is anybody else interested in hyperbolic three manifolds? If not, I'm going to skip it. Okay, <laughs> there is. <laughs> Okay, so let me give you a, 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 an application of this main theorem, thin expansion to hyperbolic three manifold. So there's a very similar theorem to this gonality theorem. It's due to lack and B in three manifold theory. So suppose I give you a hyperbolic three manifold. So this is a quotient of hyperbolic three space by a discrete subgroup acting on hyperbolic three space, which is a lattice in SL2C, which is uh, what the three manifold is. So peop uh, people are, as you know, very interested in the th hyperbolic three manifolds since we know those are the most interesting ones now after Perelman's classification of all manifolds. So take a hyperbolic three manifold and you try to understand its topology, its geometry. These are the very basic questions. There's something called the Hagar genus, which is a standard way of understanding a three manifold. And that's a, a genus of a surface sitting inside the three manifold so it's such that you can realize the three manifold as a gluing along the surface of two handle bodies. So this is some gen g genus G surface inside this. And you can prove, this is an old theorem, that every three manifold, say hyperbolic three manifold, has some surface along which you can build it as glued along, uh, as handle bodies glued along the surface. The minimum genus for which you can do it is called the Hagar genus. And that's a very subtle invariant of a three manifold, extremely subtle. People don't know how it behaves if you increase the volume, for example. However, Lackenby proved a very beautiful estimate, which is exactly, and it's proved very similarly to the Yao, uh, Yang inequality. And that is that the Hagar genus is greater than or equal to the volume, the hyperbolic volume of X times the smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian. Okay. On the other hand, the Hagar genus, the proof that every surface has a Hagar splitting, uh, this number 100 was given to me by Gabai. I understand he's coming to visit you soon, so you can ask him for the number 100. Uh, but anyway, it's linear. This all is almost identical to the Riemann surface case. The Hagar genus is at most 100 times the volume. This is a lower bound will depend on what you know about lambda 1. If you know lambda 1 doesn't go to 0, you'll have that the Hagar genus is behaving linearly with the volume, which is a fantastically nice thing to know. And this was proved, so Lackenby used the bounds, the property tau, to show that all arithmetic three manifolds have a tower of coverings whose Hagar genus grows linearly with the volume. And Lubotsky, Reed, and Long 
in 2010, on seeing this strong uh, expansion theorem, we're able to extend this to any hyperbolic three manifold. Why any hyperbolic three manifold? Well, by strong rigidity, which is well known in India, <laughs> in the Tata Institute, everyone knows about local and global and MOSTA and super rigidity of lattices in semi simple groups. If you take a lattice in SL2C, not SL2R, but in SL2C, you have local, rigi uh, local rigidity. That's a theorem of Selberg, actually. And that means that you can conjugate the group to finitely generate, you can conjugate it so it's entries are algebraic numbers in a number field and it's integers in a number field. And then the group is a thin group inside this arithmetic group. And it satisfies expansion. Ramanujan's true for a tower that you then make amongst by re reducing mod p. So this now is true for any hyperbolic three manifold that there's a, a family of towers whose Hagar genus grows like the volume. And that shows you the power here of the non you deal with a non-arithmetic group because once you have local rigidity, every group is, is thin. Every group. <laughs> so you've opened the world to all three manifolds. It, it, it's, it's something to put your head around. All right, so let me end, uh, if I can take another five minutes. So when you see these, you start to realize that thin groups are all over the show. So let me discuss that a little bit. The first thing that was kind of a shock to me as I was looking with some of my co-workers uh, to show that I started to feel that everything that you ever form is thin. Quickly became clear that you can never decide whether what you're looking at is thin. This is an undecidable problem. So here's a theorem of uh, a student of Novikov from 1958 when the word problem was shown to be unsolvable, undecidable. There's the following theorem. The, suppose I give you a subgroup of SL2Z cross SL2Z. And I give it to you as generated by seven elements. And I ask you the question, can you tell me, do these seven elements generate the whole group or not? There's no procedure. There's no algorithm that you can write down which inputs seven elements and outputs the answer correctly. To, uh, this is a halting problem. Uh, which will output whether it generates a finite index subgroup or the whole group, or whether this elements in the group generated by those. And if you can't do that for SL2Z cross SL2Z, you start to get a bit nervous. For SL2Z, there is an algorithm. So if you're a surface group, this is the Nielsen theory. You, or in a free group, you can decide uh, this question. But the minute your group's a little more complicated, you can't. So you may be sitting on a group, and I might be using this big fancy theorem at some point, and say, all right, I'm going to use that this is thin. And I'll say, but do you really need to use this? Maybe the group's a lattice. And you say, well, maybe we can never decide. <laughs> the power of the theorem is the th what you, your conclusion is still true. And in fact, that's exactly what's happened. We, we don't know how to decide. I want to show you some. So, all right, firstly, if you're a group theorist, then, you have, then thin groups are all over the show. But I'm not a group theorist. But let me just convince you that everything is thin. Suppose I'm in SLNZ. And I choose a hundred, uh, two elements, not a hundred, why two? Just choose two elements at random. Two matrices in SLNZ, and I look at the group generated by those two elements. Is it thin? The answer is yes, with high probability it will be thin. In other words, if you choose two, two matrices in a big ball, then with probability one you'll be the risky dense. So in other words, with probability one meaning the you take bigger and bigger balls and you ask what's the probability that I'm, what I'm saying is true, it'll tend to one. So if you take two elements or any fixed number of elements with very high probability, A, it will be a free group. <laughs> That's another property. It will play ping pong. The two elements will play ping pong. So there's something called ping pong. That's the only tool in the subject. If they play ping pong, it means they sort of act differently to each other. They'll form a free group. They will necessarily be uh, free, thin, and thin. Okay, so... If you're going to choose, make a group by choosing two ge uh, generators at random, that's what you're going to get. You have, but we're not interested in groups where you flip a coin to make the generators, right? But a group theorist might be. Okay, so random groups of thin. Any non-arithmetic group gives naturally a thin group. I explained that in hyperbolic three manifolds. This is the construction of Deleen and Mostel of non-thin groups, which is the only ones known in monodromy. I'll return to that at the very end. But if you uh, have a non-arithmetic group in a lattice, you have a lattice in a semi-simple group, and it's non-arithmetic, then 
it's essentially by definition, it's projection on, and, and it, you can by local rigidity, keep away from S of R, by local rigidity, you are S integers somewhere. By very definition, you are discrete already in your one factor. That's what a lattice means. And that means that you can't be finite index in the S integer points because that would force you to be dense in this factor. So you'll be infinite index. That's about the only certificate for infinite index. So in that case, the, so the, the, the non-arithmetic groups are an absolutely rich source of, but there aren't that many non-arithmetic groups. Remember, Mogulus is still. So anyway, they are a rich source of, of, uh, of thin groups. The hyperbolic reflection groups of, of Winberg and <coughs> Nicolin, they all but finitely many of them, these are groups generated by reflections, want to be infinite volume. That's what Winberg's big theorem is. So they are, they are going to be the risky dense, if you look at them, but, they will be, and, but they'll be infinite volume. So they, that's, uh, this is in hyperbolic spaces. They give naturally thin groups. All right, let me end with monodromic groups because those are the ones that come from number theory and they come from everybody. Anybody who gets, where, where do you get a group by generators? It's from monodromy. And I'll explain it in the simplest case ever. Gauss is hypergeometric or its generalization to n dimensions. And here I'll quickly indicate to you, we don't know what the hell's going on. Uh, I'll tell you everything we know in a second. All right, so what, which, are monodromy groups uh, thin or not? So I'm going to only discuss this case. Monodromy groups come as monodromy of varieties or kalabi yaws. This is a case of kalabi yaws as well, dwarf families. This is a hypergeometric function of the type n, n minus 1. So what this is, is you take the differential equation, nth order differential equation with parameters. I'm going to do only the algebraic theory. So these alphas are rational, the betas are rational. They can be moved to between, between 0 and 1. The assumption is that this doesn't degenerate, so they, no alpha is equal to any beta, but you can have repeated alphas and betas. And then you look at the following differ linear differential operator. This goes back to Riemann. Riemann invents everything, including monodromy. Yeah. Nick Katz owns the website called Monodromy. The minute you could buy a website, he immediately paid $20 for monodromy.com. <laughs> he loves monodromy, but <laughs> Riemann invented it. <laughs> So monodromy, this is what Riemann explained. He explained Gauss's work on the hypergeometric function, which would be the case n equals 2 here, is you have the differential operator z dz. So here you see theta appearing n times and here n times. So it's an nth order linear differential operator with regular singular points. And the singularities are 0, 1, and infinity. This is factored in this way. And you're looking at the solutions to this linear differential equation in the plane minus the three points. And you take your favorite point, maybe z naught there, which is the point a half. You take your set of solutions, they're analytic functions. You take n linearly independent solutions. And then you move around a curve, and when you come back, you analytically continue. You've arrived back at a new linear uh, independent set of solutions, but at some new set, which is a linear combination of what you had before. So you get a representation of the fundamental group of the plane minus three points into the vector space of solutions, and that's the monodromy representation. And the monodromy group is just what that group is. So the group is born as a group generated by these finite number of punctures, three punctures here, <coughs> and you're asking what is the image? The Zariski closure is always easy to compute in all these things. I, that was always the philosophy. And this was computed by Boykers and Heckman rather beautifully. Uh, so if you give an alpha and beta, they will tell you what the Zariski closure of the group is. And uh, basically, the other thing they do is they can tell you when the group's finite. They were very interested in when the hypergeometric equation is, has finite monodromy because then it defines an algebraic equation. These were things for n, for n equals 2, all these things were done by Schwartz many, many years ago. All right, so the question here is when, so let's, if we fix alpha and beta, I'll call a, h alpha beta following their notation. I will, uh, uh, if the, <coughs> the uh, alphas are rational, that forces the monodromy to be algebraic in a natural basis, but I'm going to assume it actually gives me integer points so I can stick to the language that I've been talking about. So it's not difficult to see when, what the conditions in alpha and beta that you actually get integer matrices here. 
In this case, there's a risky closure of H alpha beta if, if it's not finite, and they list all the cases it's finite using work of Coxet huh, and Todd. So they have one, family, one infinite family where it's finite, a few sporadic ones, and otherwise it's not finite, the monodromy is infinite, and it's a risky closure is either symplectic or orthogonal. And the question is, is it thin or not? And I told you this kind of problem is not easy to answer because it's, in principle there's no decision algorithm. So my belief here is that most of these, in the case of, I've changed my mind a little bit here, after speaking to Venki, as you'll see in a second here. But for, all right, so are they, are they thin or not? Let me give you the most famous examples here. The Dwork family used by Harris, Sh Be Baron Shepard, Shepard Baron Taylor, in their work on the proof of the uh, Cytotate conjecture. The key ingredient was the Dwork family and a certain Galois representation on the cohomology of the Dwork family. They had to use, they had to compute the monodromy, they had to compute the Zariski closure, that's half of their paper, and th they needed to know the Zariski closure because eventually they're using Weisfeiler or Nori's version because they need to know the images onto. That's the key ingredient why they need it. They don't need to know expansion in their work. But the, uh, as I explained to you in, in uh, the Ellenberg work, this could come up and you would need to know the expansion. So the, collab the Dwork family is just alpha is this and beta is this guy. That's the differential equation. And if you look, you compute the Zariski closure, it's symplectic. And the question is, which nobody knows, is that fine, is that thin or not? It's a major unsolved problem. We don't know. If you want to go work on it, I'll, I'll warn you, it's not easy. In the case of n equals 4, here are the two generators. There are two matrices in SP4. Does that generate a finite index or infinite index subgroup in SP4Z? I have no idea. And nobody seems, and that I think is an extremely hard problem. And in fact, I didn't know of any examples of hypergeometric monodromy uh, which gave you um, symplectic groups and, uh, uh, which were finite indexed. Until I came here, and on Monday, I'm glad I came, Venki showed me this example. So if you take this hypergeometric with those parameters, there's a risky closure as SP4, and he has a very beautiful argument relating it to other works he's done and works of De Camp a, a Campo using the Biro representation from which he can conclude that exactly this family, and he has no other examples which are in SP4, SPN, but this is arbitrary large N. It's quite remarkable even that there are subgroups of SPN, Z, N even, of course, uh, which are generated by two elements in finite index. Even that, I don't think we knew before. Anyway, it comes from hypergeometric. The real difficulty, so the, he's of course showing that these are finite index and then he's using techniques that he's developed and others. But we don't have any certificate when you are in, when you're thin. So many of these groups are thin, but how do I prove to you they're thin? How do I convince you that a group's infinite index? It's, it seems extremely difficult. So in that case, uh, Fuchs, Mary, and I have, at least in the case that the hypergeometric is hyperbolic, and I'm giving you an example here, so the alpha is that and beta is that, we have new techniques to, con to prove something is thin. Why is this a hard problem? I've gone over time, but it's undecidable, and it's very much like the Diophantine problem of can you decide whether a variety has rational points? It's also, okay. Integer points is undecidable. I know Barry Mazer runs around saying that he thinks the world's decidable over Q. Have you heard this? It's one of his favorite things. I, only he says it, but I think he's a good sport, meaning he's willing to say something outrageous so that if you prove him wrong, he will be embarrassed, but he'll have learned something really interesting. And we'll all have learned something interesting. And if you prove him right, uh, we'd all be... Our intuition would have been completely wrong. Anyway, over Z, you can't... Over Z, it's well known. This is Hilbert's tenth problem. You, you can't decide whether, uh, you can't give an algorithm to decide whether a variety has an integer point. If it has an integer point, you can convince me. You come and show me. If the group's finite index, you can convince me. You take your generators and you generate some generators that you know of the group. And you can convince me, and I won't argue. But suppose that the, the variety has no integer points, and you want to convince me it has no integer points. That's always hard. We don't have many invariants. We have something called the manin brow obstruction. That might, well, we have local obstructions, those you test first. And otherwise, there's a manin brow obstruction. 
So th this problem is very similar. We just don't have any robust test which you look at it and you say, all right, this will guarantee you that the group's infinite I uh, index. It's thin. So my belief is in monodromy here, they all, I believe most of them are thin, but you look at any example, it's very hard to prove it. We just don't have tools. So we've managed to find some tool and we've given the first example of thin groups in this construction. Uh, the question that uh, Katz and I had a bet on, are there any monodromies which are thin and for which the Zariski closure is simple? All constructions of Deleen and Master are products. And Nori has some unique construction in using uh, SL2 cross SL2. So there was no known example of a thin monodromy group which is simple for the Zariski closure. But that we certainly have produced here, infinitely many of them. All right, I hope I've sold you thin groups. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's always annoying when a guy has got five lectures and he still goes over time. <laughs> Okay, right, so, uh, so you must read my letter to Jeff Lagarius. It's, it's on my directory. I don't have a website, but if you go to Sarnak, I think at the Institute, and you go to my name, then there's something called Letters, and there's a letter to Jeff Lagarius which uh, g gives a proof of this, and let me explain that. So the Apollonian group is thin. It's infinite index. It's actually a subgroup uh, of SO31 over the reals. It's Hausdorff dimension at infinity. This is how you, if you infinite index, how do you measure its size? The next thing you try to do is you take a point, you take its orbit, you take its closure, topological closure on the boundary, which is now a sphere, and the sphere, the sphere is a two sphere in this case. The Hausdorff dimension of a Polonian group is about 1.3. We know that to a few decimal places. It's bigger than one, this is important. Okay, so we know that the group is quite big but it's certainly still infinite index. So what I was able to exploit is I found some subgroups of the Apollonian group, which are Fuchsian groups. They are sitting in SO2 ones. So even though it's infinite index, it contains some non-trivial arithmetic groups, quite big arithmetic groups, which are naturally sitting there, as you'll see. And then I tried to produce already primes by looking at orbits of these smaller groups. And then it, once you're in the world of arithmetic, arithmetic group, then you're doing ordinary number theory. But it's d it became something exotic, and it became a question of uh, representing certain integers uh, by binary forms, not representing primes uh, by inhomogeneous binary forms. And that's a half-dimensional sub problem, and in fact was solved by Ivanich in his thesis, I think. So eventually I reduce it to that. The actual reduction is explained there by certain calculations. So uh, the group is not that thin. So if the Hausdorff dimension were less than one, it's bigger than one, and all, many of the more striking things we know about it use that. So if it were less than one, it couldn't contain anything of this interest. It would just contain sort of basically the subgroups, the algebraic groups that would contain would just be tori. And those are very, you don't go serving for, for the, uh, Mersenne primes, you're not going to get any, so, or, or, or almost primes. However, so that's for primes. But if you want to uh, do a Brunsev on a very thin group, we can do it. So we can produce almost primes in any context, but not primes. So the, the primes is a special trick there. And that's used, and any improvement of that, and Bergen has improvements of that, use this trick with other ideas. So... It's zero. You mean what's it? Uh, you, uh, let me clarify this. Yeah. Yeah. So if, uh, you leave out the point a half. See, I, I'm not allowed to have a half here and a half there. I, I'm, I, I am orthogonal. I, I should tell you the, how you look at that and decide whether you're symplectic or orthogonal. If the, there's an eigenvalue minus one. So if you take the product of all the eigenvalues, you can tell whether you're symplectic or orthogonal. Whether the, depending on whether there's a guy which is a minus one. So a half, the half appears, must appear an odd number of times. So I, I've put a half in this one. 
So it's not allowed to appear there. They, uh, uh, that's very important that to be non-degenerate, you can't share any point in this. Otherwise, it's, it'll change. So there's a half here, and this, uh, this is just 0, 1 over n plus 1, 2 over n plus 1. n is odd. Okay? So I'm, mis I'm just illustrating that the point of half is not there. It's removed in its place down here, actually. So there are n numbers here. There are n numbers there. The, uh, the uh, hypergeometric group, uh, the monodromic group will be a subgroup of uh, n by n integer matrices. There will be a quadratic form, which is quite complicated, of signature n1, which is preserved. So it will be a subgroup of SOF, Z, where F is a quadratic form of signature N1, in which this thing is provably infinite index, the monodromy. Uh, and there, we've identified, there are nine families and about 40 sporadic examples whose signature is N1. And we have not proved that all of the families, all but finitely many in the family, we haven't handled all the families. What do we expect to, when we're done is that all but finitely many are thin. Now, if you, there, there may be a, a, a rank one to higher rank dichotomy here. Notice the only example where we're showing the things are thin and proving they're thin is a real rank one example. So there may be a surprise here. So I have a bet, the bet with cats, he said, you will never produce a monodromy which has got simple and thin. I'm producing it here in this rank one case. He might be right in higher rank. I don't believe it. The Dwork family, the Kalabi Yau families are the most challenging. So, yeah, these two matrices, do they generate? Th that, that's the Candelas example. <laughs> Famous example from Quintix, which led to the whole of mir mir mirror symmetry. The big calculation they did was to compute this hypergeometric monodromy and then some expansions. They compute this group. But they don't offer any uh, insight as to whether it's finite or infinite index in SP4Z. They call it the modular group for their setting. And they sort of write as if they know what this group is, but there's no physics that, I, that suggests what the answer should be. It's a real fantastic question, uh, a simple question like that. But they are not easy questions because there is no easy certificate for being infinite index. If it were finite index, you could compute far enough and get the generator. But suppose it's really infinite index. How do I prove it's infinite index? I mean, how will I convince you that eventually you don't come back to everybody? You start multiplying these two matrices. They look like, th this guy's not free, but I could, another, I could take another Calabi Yau family. There are 14 of them that have been identified of threefold. And you start, there's some that look like they free up to 100 generations. And now the question is, of course, if it is a free group, it has to be infinite index for cohomological reasons. But how do you actually prove that you don't come back? If you tell me you're quasi-isometric to a tree or something, then you're assuming what you want to prove, of course. So how do you know when you multiply these things and they seem to be all dispersing very quickly? Because you're multiplying big matrices and they're just getting much bigger. What's to, how do you know they're not going to come and come around in a loop. If you play ping pong, you can prove that. But ping pong, you only play ping pong when you set up the players. <laughs> I'm serious. If you're given the elements, you can ne I, I've never seen anyone play ping pong when you handed the players. So I think it's a fundamental problem. Yeah. In, it's a very good picture. It's just, uh, it's very hard to analyze that even the analysis of that's very hard. So the answer to that question is, in some cases we use it heavily, but let me, ex so there's, here's a, a real point. You said L2, because you're a real man, you talk about Hilbert spaces. Suppose you take this Apollonian case, then G is SL2C, gamma is SO31, R, and gamma is that Apollonian group. The lowest, the Hausdorff dimension is bigger than one. I emphasize that. That means there is a base eigenfunction which is underneath a continuum. It's like in quantum mechanics, you have something below the continuum. And then you can do the theory, and this base eigenfunction has a measure on the boundary called the Patterson-Sullivan measure, and you can, we actually use it. But suppose the Hausdorff dimension were less than one, the group were even thinner. Then there is no uh, L2 eigenfunction at the bottom. This continuous spectrum swallows everything up. 
And then L2 is the, uh, doesn't offer any analysis even. So all our work in general, and if you've got a higher rank, it's, nobody has ever developed any theory. So all our work carefully works combinatorially from the start to do the CIV. So we do CIV, but we never use the Riemannian structure. But for the Apollonian, we absolutely use the Riemannian structure. So if you can use it, you would use it, but in higher rank. So there's no, I've never seen any theory of any substance it's which. Yeah. You can take L2 G mod, G mod gamma and say decompose that, but uh, if you're not geometrically finite and there's no theory. So the theory is if there aren't finitely many sides for a fundamental domain. Let me point out some of these groups are finitely generated. You don't even know they're finitely presented <laughs> in principle. So you don't know how to compute a fundamental domain. So if you're going to do analysis, uh, just think back in the arithmetic case. There's something called reduction theory. Uh, that's done for you by your elders. You just assume it. <laughs> you have to develop everything from scratch here. It's extremely interesting and completely virgin territory, and I don't know. Yeah, so we, 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 uh, we looked at it in higher rank. Higher rank L2 G mod gamma infinite volume has never been touched by anybody. 